Co-founder and executive director and clinical director of the Village Project Incorporated. You know the good work they're doing. Uh, he is perhaps better known in many local communities than a long time nationally and internationally recognized human and civil rights activist who's helped lead many movements for social justice. Professionally, Mel is an acknowledged psychotherapist who places cultural competence at the center of the work of psychotherapists today. Founded in 2008 by Mel and the wonderful Regina Mason, his wife, uh, and, and experiences as a member of the Black Panther Party in the late 60s and early 70s are the primary reason he's chosen a career as a counselor and therapist, Mr. Mel Mason. Uh, also, we have Jerry Cohen, and for 14 years, specifically from 1967 to 81, Jerry was with the United Farm Workers General Council. The UFW's general counsel battled judges to get farm workers out of jail, negotiated hard-fought contracts with resistant growers from uh, resistant growers from Delano to Salinas, and was instrumental in winning a landmark labor law that gives farm workers the right to choose their union. That was Jerry's crowning achievement. Um, he was negotiating what he calls the best labor law in America. And then he courted then-candidate for Governor Jerry Brown and got him to publicly endorse a bill giving farm workers the right to a union election, the Agricultural, Agricultural Labor Relations Act. Mary Shaw Karan. After uh, retiring in 2012, uh, Mary has focused on grassroots environmental projects in the Monterey Bay region. In 2013, she helped start San Benito Rising, which passed Measure J in San Benito County, the first tracking ban by a citizens initiative in California. And then in 2015, Mary developed an environmental summer camp for underserved youth in San Juan Batista. And uh, most recently, 2016, Mary helped organize the Coalition to protect, protect Monterey County, which passed Measure Z. Yeah. And now, Mary has worked successfully to lobby 17 jurisdictions to join Monterey Bay Community Power, a nonprofit energy provider that will double the usage of renewable energy in three counties. Previously, Mary worked at Hewlett Packard for 28 years. Mary. Senator Bill Monning. Senator William W. Monning was elected November 2012 and re-elected to represent uh, the S Senate District 17, is currently the Senator, Senate Majority Leader, and he serves on budget, health, judiciary, legislative ethics, natural resources and water, and health and human services. And he's been a leading advocate uh, for reducing childhood obesity and other preventable chronic illnesses. And he was co-author of the End of Life Option Act. Thank you so much for that. He served as a civil rights um, specialist and was executive director and organizer of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And he has a long history, which you'll be hearing more about tonight, with the United Farm Workers and their struggle for justice and equity, uh, which uh, justice and equity, which their struggle informs all of our struggles. It is at the heart of dignity for all people. Thank you for all the work you do and the heart with which you do it. So, panelists, um, if you are, um, if we'll start with Mel and, and go on down here. Um, what what is Tell us a bit about your life and the struggle and why you chose to do what you did and what relevance you think that is, has uh, for us today. Okay, um, is there someone? Oh, sorry. Not here. I apologize. There we go. No. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, I, uh, my name is Mel Mason. And uh, I grew up in Seaside. I was born in, uh, in a coal mining town called Providence, Kentucky. Uh, that was at the height of Jim, Jim Crow segregation. Um, my, um, my dad uh, fought in World War II, lost all of his friends in one failed swoop. Uh, ended up with uh, 
what we now know as uh, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder, uh, was real difficult uh, to live with, which I came to understand later why. And so my mom and, and he, uh, my mom divorced him. And because my aunt, who had also uh, remarried, uh, was out here in Fort Ord, uh, and they had never been apart from each other, so she kept begging my mom to move out here to, to California. So we moved out here in 1956. I was 13 years old. Um, my life out here started pretty much, I was a basketball player. Um, actually, I was pretty good. And I can say that now. I'm old, <laughs> old, 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 uh, I can't now. I don't like to think I could then. Uh, but um, I, uh, my, my goal in life at that time was to go into the NBA. And I was one of the five top um, community college uh, transfers going to four year schools. I had 104 scholarship offers when I left uh, Long Beach Municipal College. My records are still there, so I'm like 50 some odd years. And, Nobody's broken them. I, I always say to somebody, what's well, the point that I'm talking about? And that was before. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I say all of that to say that that's, that, that was my focus. And, uh, and what happened to me uh, and what changed my course and trajectory in life was I, I finally accepted a scholarship. It was at Oregon State University. Uh, the racism there was so rife um, that I ended up, you know, not wanting to, but ended up kind of single-handedly trying to take on this formidable institution called the Athletic Department. Uh, there were other blacks on campus uh, who were athletes, uh, and they told me that I was crazy, that I was going to mess up my career, and, uh, and they, they weren't going to mess up theirs, <laughs> and so they weren't going to be with me, so it ended up being a a pretty lonely struggle. I lost my scholarship, um, and and so that was the end of my basketball career. And in fact, the National Collegiate Athletic Association had ruled that um, because of the manner in which I had uh, behaved myself, um, that I was no longer able to uh, play for any other university or college in the United States. So, my mom used to tell me, you know, God has something else for you to do. At that time, I didn't want to hear anything about God or anything else to do. Um, but in many ways, I think she was right. What happened, you know, down the road was uh, I worked at a place called Western Electric. They had no union. Uh, out of 1,500 workers, uh, there were 50 of us who were black. We had people who had not been uh, given pay raises in seven years. Uh, we had black people who were being asked to train uh, white people to be their supervisors. Uh, we organized something called the Black Workers uh, Unity Organization. It was the first time I'd ever organized anything. Um, and uh, I wasn't used to speaking about anything other than calling out plays to my teammates. Uh, I was elected to be chair of this organization. Make a long story short, we won almost every demand that we put forward uh, to end racism in that plant. And that's when uh, somebody from the Black Panther Party came to visit me and said that Chairman Bobby Seale had wanted to talk to me. And so at that point, things just rolled forward. My big takeaway from being in the Black Panther Party uh, was coalition building. And it's something that I've been a part of all of my life since then. I think you all know what happened to the Black Panther Party. Um, a lot of things happened to a lot of us uh, individually. Uh, I had my own uh, run-ins with the uh, FBI. Um, and, but in the course of all of that, I also became an elected official here in, in, in Seaside, much to the uh, chagrin and, and anger of racists. Um, on the night that uh, we were sworn in, um, I sat down in my seat and everybody started to clear out because they said that there was a bomb threat. Oh. Um, and they didn't care how many white people they killed with the bomber, quote unquote, said, as long as we get that communist nigga. Um, and so I stayed around. I didn't think it was a real bomb, so I stayed around and 
I read my city council packet. <laughs> um, so, uh, but again, you know, uh, struggles against uh, police brutality, uh, which I which I was part of for a very long time, um, and kind of marked a, a lot of my uh, uh, history as as an activist in this area. But I, along the way, I ran into people like Jerry Cohen and, uh, and Bill Monning and, uh, and Juan Martinez and Gary Cohen, Carnes and, uh, and, and, uh, and Karen. Uh, we, have, we all worked together in a lot of different organizations, uh, but we all, always came together in a coalition. And I felt uh, that the one thing that I learned in the Black Panther Party that was incredibly helpful for me in the rest of my life was building coalitions as a way of getting things done, as a way of bringing about social change. And so mm -hmm. that was, uh, that's kind of my presentation. I could go well, out and yeah, sued against the corrupt Teamsters Union because they had come in and stolen our contracts in 73. Mm -hmm. And the guy that was doing the rewrite confused my antitrust stuff <laughs> with his dead guys. And then he, <laughs> he incorporated all this farm worker stuff had nothing to do with his life. So I called the Sunday desk editor and I said, you know, you, you made a mistake here. And there was a pause and she said, are you sure? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm talking to you. I said, you, need, you need to print a correction because the family is going to see stuff that relates to their dead father and husband. It shouldn't be in there. Well, we don't do that. We'll just print a one-line sentence. And so I thought, I don't want to intrude on the family because they're grieving. So I called this law firm. I talked to his partner. And I said, I know you're grieving. And before I could finish, she said, oh, yeah, I'm really grieved. <laughs> so I, All right, I've done, I've done my duty. I've done my duty. Now, I think the reason I got involved, you know, when you're a teenager, certain experiences really strike you. My dad was a doctor in the Navy. We moved around a lot. And maybe it's because when you move, you get along with everybody because you're not there for that long. You don't care what religion they are, you don't care what color they are. And then we moved to Washington, D.C. And I had a friend named Ray Dixon, and we ran a quarter mile. He was at a school called Phelps, I was at a school called Woodrow Wilson. We finished pretty close to each other, and we were exhausted. We put our arms around each other, walked back, took off our track shoes. And after that was done, the football coach came up to me and said, Cohen, never put your arms around a nigger on the grounds of Woodrow Wilson High School. And I thought, Oh man, you know, if I ever get a chance to do something about this, by God, I will. And then I went to a small college in New England, Amherst, and they had a fraternity system, and we did our best to destroy that system because certain fraternities <laughs> wouldn't take black kids, certain fraternities wouldn't take Jews. And I found out in the course of that fight that the people that get involved in fights really enjoy them, and it's really fun to fight. <laughs> and so I decided I'm going to go to law school. I was dumb enough to think that you went to law school because people there were interested in justice, and I found out there were a few of us that were, but most of them were interested in money. Mm -hmm. Now, when we get to the farm workers, I want to give one example of just how much fun it can be, and that involves my good friend Bill. Uh, there have been books written about the farm workers, Miriam Powell wrote a really good book. Frank Barkey wrote a great book. But poor young William here doesn't even get an honorable mention in the book. But the reason I'm raising this is because after the Teamsters stole the contracts, I started filing lawsuits against them. And the Teamsters had this gaggle of well-attired attorneys from D.C. who had a great idea with the help of a local Teamster, not a local Teamster attorney, but an attorney in San Francisco named Avery Brundage. No, Bill Brundage. Avery Brundage is the racist that ran the Olympics. Right. Bill Brundage is a teamster lawyer. Well, Bill Brundage found a judge named Matheny in Riverside County who used to play football for Nebraska, and the joke was he obviously never, never wore a helmet. So he, got, he got this guy to file, file an injunction. He got a guy issue an order that Jerry Cohen cannot file lawsuits against the Teamsters. Well, what do you do when you're faced with an order like that? File another lawsuit. <laughs> got a BCLU guy who's a really good guy to defend me, and they wanted to throw me in jail for contempt. But there were some declarations, and we put a declaration on the top of the pile, so these 
hot shit Eastern attorneys would see it first. And it was from a young law student named Bill Monin. <laughs> who had been, who had been in Avery, now Bill runs his class and at lunchtime, Brunnich had said, you're not going to believe this, but and then we found a judge that was dumb enough to sign an order preventing him from filing lawsuits against the Teamsters. That was the first declaration we put on the pile. Those attorneys read it, turned bright red, and they knew it was over. And, then, and then that's just another example of how much fun it was. And you know, you're dealing with people that you can really enjoy working with. And I think, you know, it's always kind of annoying to say, we did things a certain way, therefore you should. I don't think that's what tonight is really about. There's certain values and there's certain attitudes that I think we all learned in that struggle. One is you have to be persistent. You know, you cannot give up. Fights take a long time. This fight for justice never ends. And it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And just to sort of illustrate this and wrap up my five minutes, it may seem a strange place to start, but in the 1920s in South Africa, labor laws were passed protecting workers, except the South African legislative body was honest enough to disclose their intentions. Protected workers, but in the law itself it said, except black workers. All right. So you fast forward to the New Deal when the National Labor Relations Act was passed, and the Wagner Act gave rights to all workers, supposedly, but guess what? There were two categories of workers excluded. Domestics, who were mostly black women, and farm workers. Black cotton pickers, Filipinos, Mexicans, Chicanos. It accomplished the same thing, but Congress was clever enough to do it that way. Well, it took years and years of struggle and, you know, the persistence of thousands of people who went to jail, striking and boycotting Caesar's leadership. Caesar's fast for nonviolence put us on the map. And finally, when Jerry Brown became governor, we got a law. And, you know, we're not going to have that long fight this time. Because I think one of the things we can be thankful for is, you know, sometimes when your friends make mistakes, you're sort of constrained. We know, for example, that Obama deported more people than Bush. But we knew Obama was good on a lot of issues. So thank God for the dreamers, because they took him on. Well, there's no ambiguity about what's going on there. We're totally unfettered. What we really need to do is figure out how to focus. And that's a, when there's so many horrible things going on across the board, that's a hard thing to figure out. And I'm not sure I have the answers to that, but that's what I think we need to focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Measure J County was really a very large effort by many, many people. So um, it's not just the, you know, one or two people. Um, I, I, uh, my background is, I think, you want to yes. get into that first before we talk about you know what I learned from our campaigns. Um, um, as uh, Karen has mentioned, I worked at Hill Packard for 28 years, and uh, I had gone to school at UC Santa Cruz and done some activism and worked on campaigns like John Blair's campaign, rent control campaign. If I remember, Barry Connors' presidential campaign, Jesse Jackson's campaign for president. So you know it was a period of the activism when I was in college, and then raised children, worked at Hill Packard, and I retired early because I was very concerned about climate change. <coughs> My husband and I um, started thinking about this, and we had this opportunity, it just happened, I live in Aromas, which is really on the, it's actually half Monterey County, half San Benito, and I happened to live on the border on the San Benito side, so we got involved, you know, some of the people in the audience here actually got involved sooner in this effort to to restrain the fracking effort in 2012, 2011, maybe it started earlier. Um, there are people exploring for gas, oil in, in the Aromas area. So we decided to just form a study group um, just to see what was, you know, to learn as much as we can, watch Gasland. We actually went to uh, watch a Josh Fox film, Gasland 2, and spoke to him. Um, so anyway, I, it started out with a study group of people who were interested in this topic, and it was a pretty amazing study group. It was actually uh, Natasha's book club, and they turned out to be great activists. You know, we, we try to have a very inclusive group. Um, we, after a lot of discussion and exploration, decided to do an initiative because we decided that that 
was probably the most effective way. We studied what happened in New York State, what happened in Colorado. Um, so to make a long story short, we, uh, we were able to win, you know, I should remind people that San Rito County is about one, less than one seventh the size of this county in Monterey. It's about 55,000 people or so. Um, so, uh, you know, it was not that difficult, I would say, although some people thought we were pretty crazy to do in the mission. And we also decided that we were not, you know, we're just going to do all volunteer effort. I think in a lot of ways that our naivete helped us because, um, because later on when we did have to hire during the election a professional campaign consultant, you know, I think he was very skeptical that he, he did admit that he didn't think we were going to win <laughs> afterwards. Um, so, uh, in any case, uh, then I was, you know, several of us, a number of us uh, who worked on Measure J were asked to advise on, on Measure Z. It wasn't on Measure Z yet. Um, there's an effort in Monterey, so we got more and more involved, and so a lot of you here are, are from the Measure Z campaign, and see a few of you have worked on Measure J as well. So I think, you know, what I learned is that you don't really need professionals. In fact, there's some advantages of having people who are just regular folks, because you see things in a different way. Our professional campaign consultants really had a perspective which I think really don't touch people as directly. You know, in our grassroots campaign, we had people, although we did have some professionals, Bill, Bill did a commercial for us, but it was very, you know, we just wrote it with him, and it wasn't done by any campaign consultant. We had Dolores Huerta, we had Dr. Laura Solorio, we had uh, two teachers and a fireman, and who else? There was another teacher from Soul Dad, um, Selena Sally. Um, prison who decided to do her own commercial. And so we ended up with radio ads, TV ads, kind of at the last minute when one of our um, you know, volunteers said, you have to do something. And um, so what we learned is that, you know, you need a campaign that's very inclusive, that really is very democratic. In fact, our consultants were always concerned about the fact that we try to be as inclusive as possible. And they always try to, you know, during the campaign, limit it to a smaller group. We really found that having a lot of perspectives is extremely important. Um, someone mentioned uh, coalition, and we also found that the coalition uh, concept is extremely powerful. It, we really didn't deliberately do this, but we ended up forming these coalitions, especially with Measure Z, because it's a huge population here. And uh, so we collaborate with various campaigns um, in different cities and the Democratic Party with unions, etc. Um, let's see, what was the other thing um, that someone mentioned? Um, having a lot of fun and doing things that are very enjoyable. We, I think that, you know, really our closest friends now after a few years of activism are really people who worked on the campaigns. And, you know, we, you know, one person in our campaign said the most important thing in a grassroots camp are actually two most important things. One is lots of signs you know, small signs to show grassroots support, and the other is food for your volunteers. <laughs> Good evening, and I want to also thank the Order of South America to focus a boycott that brought the growers to the table, because the moral power addressed their economic power. Um, so as we move forward, I think the first question of any organizer should be, what's the goal? What's the objective? Are we going to work to flip the congressional seat in the Central Valley? Are we going to start working towards 2020 to get Trump out of there, hopefully before? They're not mutually exclusive, but if you're going to build an organizing campaign, what is the objective? And then in building organization, social media is a great tool, but I may be old fashioned. One of the things I learned from the union is the power of house meetings, of building relationships with people who share a circumstance of disempowerment and through organizing are going to gain power. And coalitions are critical with Mel, we built coalitions. We had a 911 system, which was Mel's house. Um, <laughs> whenever there was a Rodney King verdict or a uh, bombing of uh, the assault in Panama, bombing in Iraq, we reached out, we pulled together LULAC, 
uh, NAACP, National Lawyers Guild, ACLU, all the organizations that do their own organizing have their own focus, but this is a crisis. Let's pull together. We go to the library in Salinas, we do a press release, and there'd be 15, 20 people at the front of the room representing all shades, shapes, and areas of Monterey County. And we'd speak with one voice, although each organization would have their statement. Um, and we were focused, we knew why we gathered for that episodic pulling together. But to get Trump out of the White House, to flip these congressional seats, or to take power in local elections, is the focus electoral. That's actually one of the easier organizing feats because it lends itself to numbers. You know how many votes you need and where are you gonna get them? But I'll stop there, we'll open it up, but um, uh, coalition building, focus, having the cause that people care about, and you speak to what they care about, and then the art and science of building your movement with numbers, targets, and accountability. So we've passed legislation this year, it's not law yet, it's moving to the assembly. Sentencing laws, people with a drug conviction, simple possession, who've done their time and get arrested on another charge. If they have that prior conviction and they've done their time, a judge automatically has to add a two or three years to the sentence on the new one. And it's not, it's not negotiable, it's not um, discretionary. So we're removing that. Because it puts the ones who are the ones that get picked up on the streets. Um, we also just passed a bill yesterday, brought by Senator Hertzberg, I'm a co-author, to eliminate bail as we know it. Bail is what puts people in jail before trial, before conviction, and they sit in there and they lose their job, they learn their lose their earning capacity. Uh, and yet, they don't meet the test of a flight risk or security risk. So what we're going to retool is to say, if, if you're not a flight risk and uh, you're not a security risk, you should be released pending your trial. Now, who do you think is opposing this? The bail bondsman from all over the state. And there's some guy, I don't watch TV, but there's a bounty hunter who has a dog, who's a famous dog. So he was walking around the Capitol the other day, urging people to vote against this bill because it was going to hurt his business. On the immigration front, oh, one other comment. We have, since our leadership took over in the Senate, we have moved our budget ticker for the first time in 20 years, we're putting more into higher education than into the prison industrial context. Yeah. I credit Jerry Brennan for realignment and for looking at, you know, over a majority of people in our prisons have a mental health diagnosis and they've never received mental health treatment. So what Jerry Brown and we've done with realignment is say, those folks should be getting treatment for alcohol addiction, drug addiction, mental health, that's where our dollars are better invested, is in treatment, not in terminable incarceration. And just let me close on the immigration front, because we've also, we've passed laws, uh, the sanctuary state one hasn't gotten to the governor yet, it's also in the assembly, but it basically says, it, it states what's the current law. Immigration laws are federal. They can be enforced by federal officers but not by city police or sheriffs. And we carve out exceptions for gang task forces and drug task forces. But what Trump has signed eliminates due process for people. And Jerry talked about families getting a guardianship for their kid. But there's another collateral damage to this. It's called toxic stress. And teachers are seeing it in classrooms. Children who are fearful that their parents may be deported, or they may be deported, or they may get separated. And it's called toxic stress. And you have it in communities where there's a lot of violence and drive-by shootings. And so kids can't concentrate. And it leads, it makes them more susceptible to illness and disease, including mental illness. So what Trump has set in motion, we haven't begun to see the total public health consequence of it. Uh, but again, I think being aware and mindful and giving voice to teachers and families who are dealing with this every day is how we empower the state legislature and others 
to protect the backbone of our economy. My district, the three leading employers, agriculture, hospitality, tourism, and higher education. And the first two, it's immigrant workforce. Mm -hmm. They are the backbone of our economy. We should honor them and protect them. Excellent. Thank you very much. And you have to enfranchise those people who've been disenfranchised. The example I'll give you, you know, during Reconstruction, there was guys in white robes that ran around trying to kill people that were trying to vote in the South. Now we do it a little more in a more sophisticated way. We have these jerks in their black robes sitting up there, cutting the Voting Rights Act, which they have no business doing. So, so we have to start speaking out. And one thing I really like, and it gets back to Mel's interest in basketball, you know, when Michael Jordan was asked to endorse the guy who ran against that racist segregationist Jesse Helms, Michael Jordan, who was a great basketball player, but didn't have much of a moral backbone, said, even Republicans buy Nikes. Now, you'll notice that even though we're, we're rooting against LeBron James right now, when Trayvon Martin was murdered, they all wore hoodies. When Garner was smothered to death by cops in New York, he wore a t-shirt, I can't breathe. Well, he's getting his the vengeance of the racists now when they're, when they're attacking him, but a lot of people in a lot of vocations who have voice are starting to speak out, and I know from people I know, they are impressed by this, and I think we're going to have to do whatever we can to enfranchise the people who really should be voting in this country, and then we'll be able to address climate change and everything else, but race is still at the heart of this, from my point of view. I would just say the, the New Deal would be a carbon-free New Deal. We just passed this week a 100% renewable energy goal by 2040, and we moved up the 50% target to 2020 from 2030. Governor Brown right now is in China, working with China. We're also going to build an alliance of states committed to the Paris Treaty on Climate. Um, I recommend a Bill McKibben op-ed in today's New York Times we're at a tipping point, and what Trump is doing is an assault on not just our nation, but on the planet and future generations. So a carbon-free commitment, and that does lead to infrastructure investment. Uh, we've created 500,000 renewable energy jobs in California. We've created more jobs in renewable energy than all of the coal-related jobs in the country right now. And my final pillar, and there's certainly room for a lot more, would be public health promotion and building a health care system based on the promotion of health and wellness, not the treatment of illness and disease. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, if you understand that there are people that need to leave at, at 7, please take care of yourselves. We're going to go another uh, five minutes here answering the final question and then uh, just a little uh, wrap up and thank you to the volunteers. Um, so the battles are many, and the road is long, uh, and they keep coming. You know, we look one direction and we see that uh, we're stepping out of these agreements regarding uh, with, with the rest of the world, all the two nations, uh, regarding the Paris agreements. And at the same time, uh, with, it's being declared an emergency that women cannot get contraception and it's being snuck in without any public discussion or debate because of the person occupying the White House now uh, declaring an emergency. What's this emergency about women's contraception? This just happened. And sneak that in there so there's no public discourse about it while we're all scuttling over here with fire after fire after fire. It's going to be a long few years. Um, in the times when you have uh, struggled most, what have you found, what would you like to say to folks as we uh, realize that whatever I've been doing, I've got to do more. I have to lead. I have to be more agile about being a, a leader, a, a follower, or whatever I have to do, I have to do more of it. What did you find in yourself at those darkest times? Uh, and I'm not asking you to share anything that's that's too personal, but what you're willing to share that you observed or experienced when you thought, dear Lord, how am I going to do this? But I'll lead off and we'll send it around this way. Um, it's been alluded to, these movements, coalitions, organizations, they can be a place for friendships and building unity and sustenance, 
but they can also be wrought with conflict, personality disorders. Um, you have to keep in mind the larger yeah. calling. Yeah. It's not about any one person's personality or individuality. It's 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 for the common good. But as Jerry said, some of these struggles take forever. Some of these we may not see the dream we have in our lifetime. But in the path of building friendships, the UFW, in addition to everything it achieved, a lot of relationships came out of that. A lot of cross-cultural relationships, people with very diverse backgrounds who met in the union. And I think to Karen's question on point, the deepest, darkest, the failures, the hitting a brick wall, the frustration, you got to take care of yourself. No cause is so important that you should run yourself into the ground because then you're no use to the cause. Um, so you got to take care of yourself. And whatever that means, you got to protect the time. We have a friend who worked in our coalitions, Bill Melendez, and we'd be at these meetings of the uh, Civil Rights Coalition, and we'd be looking for the next meeting, and, and Bill would have his calendar there, and he'd say, well, I have, I have a therapy appointment that morning. Well, he's being pretty candid about it. Well, his therapy was riding his bicycle, but he blocked it out. He blocked it out on his calendar, and he just wrote therapy. And so he'd go to meetings, and he'd say, well, I can't. I have my therapy session. Then. So whatever your therapy session is, put it in your calendar. I think having a vision is also something that I think has helped us, you know, for uh, a lot of people. I think we were accused by some people when we started Measure J and Measure Z of being uh, too narrowly focused. And I think people didn't realize that we actually, some of us had a more of a vision. And I think and we're at a point where we have to discuss what that vision might be and, you know, discuss it in together. The other thing that we, we I think, learned is that um, Measure J and Measure Z activated a lot of people, a lot of activists who now have the skills to organize. And um, we also learned in, in our fight in, you know, for community choice energy that uh, a lot of the city councilors are not as progressive as we thought. <laughs> and also um, the board supervisors. So we decided, some of us, that we need to <laughs> kind of activate um, the activists in various cities to really work on getting better city council members, better school boards even, you know, just really shake things up and make it better because what we thought, you know, Measure Z um, and Measure J was kind of like a flashlight, and so was Community Choice Energy, it was like a flashlight shining in the nooks and crannies of our body politic, and we found a lot of corruption, you know, the mayors, who came out against Measure Z and did that commercial. Um, <laughs> um, and anyway, and also who's, who were against Community Choice Energy for various reasons. Uh, so we really felt, and that's what we're, we're thinking of doing now, is to form a group that will work on educating people in various communities. And there's actually a lot of interest, like Margaret or Becky is working on changing the city council in King City right now. and. Um, because what happens is when you discover this, if the city council is not responding to what people want, you just basically, you know, even if you don't win that, you have to change that city council. So, Thank you. Uh, As to the past, when things got tough, we always had a sense of community and each other. So if Juan de la Cruz is shot through the heart or not, he's beaten to death, and Bill comes back with his report, it helped forge really strong ties for those of us who are working together to fight back and make sure we could get what justice we could. As to what's going on now, I've had the opportunity to speak to young people quite often, and my grandkids, they're way ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. They know what's going on with our oceans. They know what the threat to climate change is. The question of somebody being gay, that's about as interesting to them as if somebody's left-handed or right-handed. It's relevant. <laughs> give us a lot of hope and we should focus on those young people. Great.
Yeah, and this is probably going to somewhat echo what Bill and what what, what Bill, Mary, and, and Jerry uh, just said. But in our experience, and I'm glad that you you brought up uh, Bill Melendez because um, as a therapist, I thought, wow, this is this is really great for Bill to be able to disclose that and not have stigma and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I found out he was riding his bicycle. You know, that that was pretty cool as well. But I think the thing that we learned and. and we had a number of coalitions that we worked in to, together. Um, certainly the Civil Rights Coalition, and we had some real battles against the DA and uh, the jail. We actually changed uh, how the jail was operating. We created a, a civil rights a hotline so that inmates could call the uh, Equal Opportunity Office or call you know, any of our civil rights organizations and not have uh, some deputy uh, you know, in between them. That's, that's, I, I think we're on Fight to get that back, uh, but we also had some other battles that we that we didn't win, and and I think we got somewhat on a roll, and then when you have one that you don't that, that you don't necessarily win, like you know one or two of the killings over in Salinas, it was real easy to all of a sudden get down. It was also real easy for some of us. I'll just talk about myself and my bad temper. Uh, you know that where you almost want to go out and do something solitary. And you have to remember that you that whatever you do, you know, is going to reflect on the whole coalition. They won't just say, well, you know, Mel Mason went out here and acted a fool. It is the Civil Rights Coalition, <laughs> you know, and as one of its uh, uh, representatives did this, but it will always be the organization. So you keep the organization in mind. It's that organic body that you are part of. And whether you have a leadership position in it or not, Everybody has the same investment in the organization uh, and, and the work. And, uh, and, and it's also a place of solace. You know, um, the, the, the friendships that you talk about that come out of it uh, start from the fact that when you come together, even if it's to come together to talk about we just got our bus with, that everybody can say, yeah, we. God bless you. And we are going to get back together and kick somebody else's butt. You know, it, it, it's always it's always about we well, the beauty of the, of the coalitions and also coalitions. You know, give you a lot of different perspectives so that when you, you and it's the coalition that decides what's, what the focus is going to be. You know, and so uh, staying with the coalition is absolutely critical. And it's, it's really critical when you start having things not go quite your way. You know, that you recognize, one, that you didn't go out here and screw up on purpose. That you were working your butt off and it just didn't quite work. And what you do is you go back and say, what can we learn from that? And we learn from that collectively. So that way, when we come out of a defeat, if, the, if you want to call it a defeat, you know, then we come out even stronger than we were at the time that this so-called defeat happened. I place so much value on coalitions for all of those different reasons. Uh, and, um, and, and, I, I, and, and, and Jerry, you're right. Uh, years ago, I would go to different places, whether it was South Central, whether it was uh, Hunters Point, whether it was... And I found all of these young people, young, black, brown, and white people that were progressive, and, and they were fine in their own way. And in some cases, they were better off without us old timers telling them what to do. <laughs> yeah, because they were beginning to figure it out. And I think that, that that is kind of the thing that's heartening for me, is that, yeah, we can all share our, our experiences. And thank goodness that we came before you. You know, that we're slowly but surely becoming ancestors. <laughs> scary to think about. <laughs> thank you. But, but you have... But you have that, that foundation to work from, you know. And these young people today are fearless, and they won't take no for an answer. That's right. And I'm just so happy that they're here. And when I see things like Black Lives Matter, you know, when I see, uh, uh, you know, young people, you know, in coalition standing up against, you know, attacks on, on immigrant workers. When I see all, and, and it's young people, you know, we, you know, it's almost like you're rolling back in time. You know, we used to be in school, you know, raising hell. Now we see that young people, whether they're in school or not, are out here raising hell. They are a force to be reckoned with, you know, and the best thing that we can do is stay out of their way. <laughs> <laughs>
And, and maybe we could make, and I, and I think hopefully we have some wisdom that we've learned from all these years. But this struggle goes on. And whether it's Trump or anybody else that's in office, you know, it's ultimately the people in the street that's going to determine what, what kind of social change happens if it happens at all. It's not going to be, Trump's not going to be able to stop the masses of people in this country that's certainly not going to be able to stop the masses of leadership that's coming from our young folks in this country. So all of that is really, really hopeful for us, and I see a great future, future a bright future ahead for this society, regardless of whether Trump or anything, any damn thing else is sitting up there in the White House, and maybe he won't even be there that much longer anyway. <laughs>